everything in there. And I would like to introduce our speaker, our presenter. Uh, we're pleased to have Andy Pinelli with us tonight. He's from the Citizens Climate Education, a nonpartisan, not-for-profit grassroots organization that's dedicated to educating everyday citizens about the potential perils of climate change and options for sensible solutions. Andy has an undergraduate and graduate degree from the University of Notre Dame. He spent three decades with Fortune 500 companies in product development and innovation. He's on the environmental committee for the village of Homer Glen, and he's spent seven years volunteering with citizen lobbying groups, encouraging Congress not to act, uh, encouraging Congress to act on climate change and meeting regularly with US congressional representatives. So please welcome Andy, and I thank you for coming tonight. Okay, Andy, you'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah, that always, that always happens. <laughs> I want to uh, thank Janet and the uh, Aurora Public Library team for uh, hosting this tonight, and I'm so glad that all of you could uh, could make it. I think you're going to find this presentation very interesting and it's very interactive. So we're gonna need your good thinking uh, to try to uh, help see if we can create a more livable world here. So we'll talk about climate change tonight and uh, I'm gonna show you a powerful new climate simulator it was seven years in the making and it only became available last year. And we'll use this together and see if we can come up with some ideas on how to best solve the, uh, the, the, the climate problem, the climate crisis, I might say. Now, what uh, I hope that uh, you're going to be able to walk away with, and I'll just pull the slides back up again here for a minute. Um, let's see here. So what I hope you're gonna be able to uh, walk away with uh, tonight is a better understanding of the, uh, the drivers of uh, uh, in, in dynamics of the climate problem, the relative effectiveness of possible solutions, uh, legislative approaches that are being considered in Congress, and some things that, that, that you could do to make a difference. So, uh, the the En-ROADS simulator, and this is uh, just a, a, a picture of it, uh, it's uh, from MIT Sloan, and it was a breakthrough in providing a model that's easy to use. I'm going to give you a copy of this or uh, of the link to uh, play with it yourselves after the event. Um, uh, it's easy to use, but it can also generate output very similar to many of the respected supercomputer models that are out there. And it can generate output in, in milliseconds rather than hours or days. So this gives educators and policymakers a powerful new tool to try to get their ideas across. And it utilizes the best available science from the International Energy uh, Agency, the IPCC, the World Bank, the World Economic Forum and other credible uh, organizations. So you'll help us select tonight from about two dozen or more different possible solutions to climate change. These levers move as they move energy inputs change and CO2 emissions drop, which drives this temperature in the upper uh, left-hand corner of your screen uh, at 3.6 degrees, tries to bring that end of century temperature down. So it's gonna be uh, a very uh, uh, fun process, but I wanted to just take a minute and share some history on how I became kind of an engaged citizen on this uh, climate issue. I started diving as a teenager. I dove all over the Western hemisphere. I love it. It's like being in a zoo without a cage. But the, uh, uh, since I started diving over half the world's coral reefs are now dead. Some of those reefs were over a thousand years old. And uh, uh, there's an, a number of things that are contributing, but two of the major ones are uh, water temperature from climate change. Uh, the, the reefs live in a very narrow temperature uh, range. And also of that extra 40 billion gigatons of CO2 that we pump up into the sky each year, 
about half of it's absorbed into the ocean, making it more acidic, and that interferes and damages with the reefs. So uh, experts say that the reef will be gone in the next 30 years and uh, at the current pace of decline. So it's, it's more than just uh, me trying to keep my favorite pastime alive, uh, hoping that maybe my grandchildren will get to dive those reefs someday. Uh, the coral reefs are the ocean's nurseries and one quarter of ocean species depends on the reefs, one in four. And there's uh, over a billion people that get some portion of their daily protein uh, from uh, the oceans. So if we lose the reefs, we lose the biodiversity, we weaken the ecology, and uh, people will struggle uh, for uh, sustenance. So um, now, in, uh, I understand we're going to spend a minute talking about the greenhouse effect. And I understand uh, that 40% of US voters don't accept the consensus science out there that says most of the climate change that we're experiencing is a result of human activity. So it's beyond the scope of this presentation uh, tonight to try to defend the science. We're not gonna do that and we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the science. Uh, but uh, to level set the audience, I wanna just take 90 seconds to uh, describe what the uh, current consensus science is on climate change. And consensus science, by the way, doesn't mean that there's 100% agreement. It does mean that the vast majority of peer reviewed climate scientists agree with the conclusion. So here's the summary of it. Uh, we, ha we have a greenhouse gas effect. Uh, up in the upper atmosphere, we've got water vapor and nitrous oxide and CO2 and, uh, and, and methane swirling around up there. It's up there uh, by a natural means. That's a good thing. It allows the sun's uh, solar energy to hit the earth. The earth heats up and then it releases that heat and some of it's trapped. A very good thing without the greenhouse effect, the earth would be 60 degrees cooler and barely able to support life. But uh, over and since the, uh, since the, uh, uh, the industrial revolution there in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, we've been putting a lot of uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from burning all sorts of fossil fuels and through uh, agricultural means and uh, and the net result is we now have about 50% more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than, uh, than we have had at any time in the last 800,000 years. Um, uh, these uh, respected scientific organizations that you've probably heard of say that the warming that we're experiencing and will continue to experience uh, is a result of this additional carbon dioxide, which is like putting an extra blanket on, um, to hold heat in, more heat in. So uh, what they would say is, is that um, the warming that we're experiencing is not, uh, there's no other theory, not, not volcanoes, not earth wobble, not solar flares, not uh, some sort of... Uh, uh, naturally occurring warming trends that explains the phenomenon that we're experiencing now with equivalent accuracy or scientific rigor. They put it right on their website. They stake the reputation on it. So um, uh, for those that might be skeptical in the audience, tonight what we're, we'll do is we'll ask you to put on your what if they're right hat. Okay, so we're not going to try to uh, defend the science, but that's that's the science uh, as stated uh, from a consensus standpoint. So, um, so let's take some clues, and, and when we start working with the model, where's all this carbon dioxide coming from? Now, carbon dioxide is is seventy five percent of the problem, but there's another twenty five percent of of emissions from methane and other gases that also contribute to uh, global warming, but but from the CO2 component, the lion's share we've got from burning coal, if we look back at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution through almost today, uh, from burning coal, 
uh, burning oil, natural gas, other, which includes uh, making cement um, or burning off the uh, flaring natural gas from, from dumps. Um, also, land use changes are driving this 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide or more that we're uh, experiencing now every year, year in and year out. Uh, that's the additional uh, carbon footprint. So if we look at the temperature at the end of this last century, um, we're in, in, in how it's changed, we see that on this axis, it's centigrade. We see it's about one degree or about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer uh, than it, uh, now than it was at the turn of the last century. So um, with some pretty astonishing geophysical consequences. Now, um, I get the argument that the earth is, or the climate is always changing, but many scientists believe that it's changing about a hundred times faster than anything we would consider normal. Now, there's consequences, and, uh, and, it, and it's expensive business as usual if we don't do anything. If we look at 1980 and up through 2020, we can see a trend. Uh, these are billion-dollar disaster events, inflation-adjusted. So we see from 1980 to 2020 a 400% increase in the number of billion-dollar inflation-adjusted storm events. That's on this axis is the number. On this axis is the dollar volume of those also inflation adjusted. We see a 400% increase in the total dollar volume. In 2017, we have $450 billion of disaster. Um, I'm talking droughts, wildfires, uh, flooding. This is just in the United States, flooding like the four foot rainstorms uh, in Houston. Uh, we're talking hurricanes, um, uh, some sea level rise surges. Th these are these are um, some of the uh, costs, and and attribution science is getting better and better. And there's some portion of that that is a result uh, of of uh, climate change, and uh, taxpayers, we taxpayers, are paying a big chunk of that. Now, if we look at where this model. And this model is a little bit uh, more benign, but most of these uh, uh, supercomputer models are putting end of century temperature at 3.6 to 4.6 degrees. So we see it climbing, climbing, climbing uh, into 2100. And um, so that'd be about 6.5 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Now, there's a couple of things about this. Um, first of all, 3.6 degrees may not seem like much, but that's an average temperature. So the temperature is going to be cooler over water and hotter over land. Also, that the average temperature, um, uh, it's an average temperature. So it may be, you know, four degrees Fahrenheit hotter in some places, but 12 degrees Fahrenheit hotter in other places. So uh, in, in, uh, it, you know, it can vary. So uh, that can make it very disruptive. And also final point is, is that the earth hasn't been this consistently warm for uh, 10 million or more years. So uh, reasons to be concerned about a business as usual scenario. Um, you know, uh, lots of bad things happen when things get warmer and, and especially if they get that warm, we've got more droughts, wildfires, melting glaciers, rising sea levels, uh, that can lead to political instability, climate refugees, and, and uh, Moody analytic, Moody's analytics put it at about potentially $69 trillion worth of worldwide damages uh, by the year uh, 2100. So it's expensive not to do anything. If we look at Florida, um, uh, projected by end of century, uh, almost $400 billion of damage from rising sea levels. That was a survey by the National Geographic. But uh, enough of, uh, of that. Uh, we've got about a dozen of these supercomputer models. They're all built around the world in use 
highly respected, frequently referenced. Uh, and uh, these can kind of break down uh, in zones, worldwide zones, what is likely to happen where. But when we look in aggregate, uh, we can see that they're all saying about the same thing. Um, and this model that we're using tonight is calibrated to a half a dozen of these supercomputer models. So we can expect similar results to come out of, of this uh, MIT Sloan model that we'll be using. And I'm going to go right to the model now without, uh, without hesitation. But I want to say that one limitation of this model is that um, if we're trying to get down to 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade increase, which is what the Paris targets are, um, this model kind of can't differentiate about what the temperature is going to be in Australia or what the temperature is going to be in the United States. Uh, it's an aggregated model. It's worldwide. So as you make suggestions for what we ought to do, we're going to make an assumption that all the countries of the world are going to adopt your suggestion and do it. And we're going to look at what the overall world average global temperature uh, is going to be as a result of that. So I'm going to pull the uh, I'm going to pull the uh, the model up right now, and uh, and we can start playing with it. But I'd like you to think for a minute while while I'm pulling this model up. I'd like you to think about actions that you've seen. Uh, maybe the state has taken some actions. Maybe your company has taken some actions. Maybe groups that you've been involved with have taken actions, or maybe you've watched and looked at what other countries are doing and think that that might be uh, impressive to try to do. Uh, I want you to take a look at um, and, and, and just start typing some things in the chat box while I, I pull this model up. And um, hang on, I'm going to stop share for a minute here. and. Uh, access the uh, the model okay so we have the model up right now and uh, uh, can you see it okay Janet and could you un uh, and, and we'll ask people to unmute when they when they uh, have ideas or suggestions uh, but uh, I want to make sure, First of all, as, as, I, as I tell you what this um, uh, model kind of does, is I want to make sure everybody kind of moves their uh, gallery view or their picture bar so that you can see this 3.6 degrees centigrade in the upper right-hand corner of your um, uh, of your uh, screen. If you uh, if you left click on your, your uh, gallery view you, you, and hold, you can move your uh, pictures because um, that's going to be important. That's one of our gauges. But the way the model works is we have these global sources of primary energy. And again, we're looking at a business as usual scenario right now. This is suggesting that well, we're not going to really do anything different than we're doing right at the moment. And if we do that, we're going to, this uh, brown area is the amount of coal we expect to burn through 2100. The red area is oil. The blue area is natural gas. Green is renewables. By renewables, I mean uh, wind, solar, geothermal, um, hydro, and then the pink is bioenergy, and that little blue sliver up top is nuclear. So um, if we burn, uh, if we utilize that uh, amount energy in that mix, what we can expect is in 2020, we generated about uh, net greenhouse gas emissions. That's CO2 plus the other greenhouse gas emissions like uh, uh, methane, uh, refrigerants, F gases. Uh, we, so we, we generated almost uh, 56, 57 tons of uh, gigatons of uh, CO2 equivalent greenhouse gases. By 2060, we would expect that to grow but to 75 gigatons. 
by 2100 over 90 gigatons. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. Half of all of the, 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 the CO2 we put in the atmosphere, we put in the last 30 years. So um, if, we, if we do this, if that's our energy mix and in those quantities, we're gonna get this result more than likely and we're gonna drive uh, the temperatures into this. Now there's, there's a lot more behind this uh, model and I can show you it, but I'm gonna wait till the, the end of the presentation if anybody wants to lift the hood on this and see more of how it works. Um, so there's a lot of levers that we can move to try to take action. Let me explain those to you. On energy supply, we can try to reduce the coal, oil, and natural gas that we use. And the primary tool to do that is you want to less of something, you tax it. We can either tax or subsidize bioenergy if we think that's a good thing or a bad thing. We can subsidize renewable energies and nuclear because those tend to be carbon free. Or we can work on some altogether new technology like thorium uh, fusion, fission or nuclear fusion, or we can put a carbon price on the emissions of these fossil fuels. Um, we can also uh, look at the transportation sector, try to make things more energy efficient, like our CAFE standards, or we can electrify it. Uh, uh, not only uh, uh, all sorts of different transportation, not just automobiles. We can do the same thing in building an industry try to make it more energy efficient so that we use less of these, uh, especially fossil fuels, or electrify it so that we're not, uh, we're not using boilers, but electric heat um, instead of uh, uh, gas heat or coal to, to generate uh, heat for uh, buildings. We can tinker with population or economic growth, land use and industry emissions like slowing down deforestation, or um, uh, trying to limit methane uh, release from agriculture or other industrial processes like fracking. Or we can look at carbo carbon removal technologies. We have a host of carbon removal technologies that, uh, that we can use even, uh, the, the, now they're not, uh, <laughs> they're not developed yet, but they're working on them. And that includes direct air capture, um, uh, bioenergy uh, uh, capture and sequestration uh, and, and other forms, uh, uh, agricultural, uh, rec you know, cover crops, that sort of thing. But also uh, we can look at afforestation like Trump's billion tree program, for instance. So we have all these different ideas that we can kind of uh, play with and watch our greenhouse gas net emissions as we start to uh, keep your eye on that line, as we start to make some assumptions about what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it. Notice that it, it changes our energy mix up here in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, it's reducing coal, uh, oil, natural gas uh, mix, and that's driving down in the blue line our, our, our temperature, oh, and look, it, it's dropping our end of century temperature from 3.6 uh, to 2.5. So this is kind of how the model works. And, uh, um, and I uh, would love to, uh, to hear what some of the suggestions are, uh, Janet, um, and, uh, and, and who's making them so that if we need to, we could uh, ask some more questions? I don't see anything in the chat yet. Uh, would anybody like to unmute themselves and make a yeah, suggestion? Please unmute yourself and, and give us an idea to try to test here. Do we have any suggestions? So we, we, saw, um, we saw from our graph um, of all of the contributors to our CO2 emissions. We saw that coal played a pretty big part in that. Does anybody want to try to do anything with coal to try to reduce our end of century temperature? Okay, if we could um, take out coal 
So if the, we stop burning coal and maybe cut oil by half, what would happen? Okay, so uh, let's try that. Now, uh, one of the things that we'll look at is uh, we'll, we'll put a tax on coal, but you've, you've actually suggested one thing that's very interesting that uh, can take it a step further. We can tax coal, let's put a, a, a big tax on it, $100 per ton, and let's play that back and see what it's done here. Watch, watch our coal after we've put that, um, that tax on it. Oops, hang on. Um, all right, let's see here. Are you, are you still seeing the, uh, the simulator up there? No, we're not. Okay. Hang on. Um, okay. So we put a hundred and ten dollar a ton tax on there, and uh, let's play it back. Okay, let's try that again. Hang on. So, okay, you you see uh, is let's uh, let's try that again. We've got uh, so you see how much coal is reduced as a result of that. So that is is it done anything to anything else? Keep keep your eye on that. Have you noticed anything else growing or shrinking? Okay, so it's primarily, it looks like it's primary, primarily affecting coal and the usage of coal. And, and what has it done to our temperature? Uh, it, it's reduced it two tenths of a degree uh, centigrade. Uh, so if we're trying to get this down to between 1.5 and 2.0, uh, let's, uh, um, let's see if uh, uh, it's 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 gotten us you know uh, it's gotten us a, a pretty good way there. Now there's one more thing about coal that we can do, is we can stop building coal infrastructure. Uh, notice what happened when I when I clicked that to this graph in the lower left. This is the primary coal usage. If we stop building coal plants. You see how that line dips down lower? And that's because uh, if you stop building coal plants, you know, those things have a life cycle of about 35 years. And if they build them, they're gonna use them. So you see it, it dramatically reduces what's going on in year 2040 to 2100 when we stop building coal plants. So that added another two tenths of a degree centigrade to to our um, to to um, our reduction. So we started out at three point six, and now we're we're at three point two, and we're going to now. The suggestion is to do something about oil. So what do you think? Uh, I'm sorry. Who, whose suggestion was that? I don't have visibility to the gallery. I'm sorry, who was that? Oh, that um, Jennifer. Jennifer. Okay, Jennifer. Um, uh, what do you think will happen if we tax coal or oil similarly? What do you think is going to happen to our temperature? Uh, it will go down. Okay, it'll go down. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look um, at what happens. How much do you think it'll go down? Um, What's your best guess? I would say maybe eighty percent. Oh, so um, you you think that it'll it'll take us um, down to what number? If it's three point two now, where do you think the number will land? Um, let me think. So you got four tenths of a, of a degree with yeah. your first one. Okay. Maybe three tenths. Okay, let's try it. 
Okay, so we're taxing oil and we got it down to um, two tenths. So let's play it back and see what's happening on our graph here of primary energy usage. Uh, what do you notice as I play that back? So what's happening to the red zone, which is oil? It's definitely decreasing. It's shrinking, yep. And then we see some growth in the in natural gas in blue and some growth in green, which is renewable energy. So, so we're kind of trading off oil for natural gas there a little bit. But, um, but as we make these things more expensive, we're also seeing our overall usage go down because people are being a little, they're, they're conserving more because we've just made coal and oil a little more expensive. So good, good work. We've gotten down from 3.6 to three, and we're trying to get down to two or, or 1.5. And um, um, uh, so uh, we, we, we came close to meeting your expectation there. Who else has some suggestions um, that, uh, that maybe we should do? Any ideas out there? What happens if you go full on the electrification of transport? Well, so as, let's see if everybody's driving an electric car and we amp up our mass transportation and electrify that. And basically what we'll be saying in this scenario is that we're going to increase, um, we're gonna really increase and electrify most of the rail and road that we can. Um, and that's got us uh, down to, well, we only got a 10th of a degree out of that. Uh, did that meet, uh, and, and who, whose suggestion was that? That was me, Ken. I was just interested to see if it really would help much. And in fact, it doesn't help a lot. Uh, even if we all went to electric cars and trucks, we're going to need to change a lot of other things too. Yeah, Ken. So, um, yeah. And, and did you expect it to do more? No, I did not. I just okay. wanted to see what the supercomputer would say. Okay. So the the um, um, a lot of people do expect it to do to do more, but if we're you know we're still firing powering some of that with coal and oil and natural gas, um, even though we've, we've put pretty hefty tax on there, um, we're, we, we're, uh, we're, we're still, you know, we're still leaning somewhat on there, uh, on, on those. Let's take a look just for the heck of it. Let's check out a graph that tells us kind of our, um, uh, hang on just a second. I want to see one graph here in terms of the relative cost of electricity. So, yeah, we're seeing uh, more in this green line is wind and solar. So that now is cheaper, uh, but coal is still pretty cheap. Natural gas is even cheaper than coal. So some of the some of the power that's powering our electric cars is going to be coming from. Uh, gas fired and coal fired power plants still because it's taking a while to ramp up if we look at um, if we look at our uh, main graphs here um, hang on so you know we're, we're really not building our um, our our green energy, our renewable energy, out till after uh, 2040. And actually, in our scenario so far, natural gas is, is still a pretty big, is the biggest slice of our energy. Granted, it's cleaner than uh, oil or coal, but it's still driving a lot of the power behind this electrification. How about another idea? Anything that you've uh, seen or are doing or think other people should do, or if we all did it, it could, um, it could 
uh, be a good thing to do worldwide? Um, maybe increase um, renewables and energy efficiency. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a look at that. Okay, so we can subsidize renewables quite a bit. We can subsidize that, I think, uh, to uh, about uh, three cents a kilowatt hour, and um, which would be a pretty healthy subsidy for that. What do you think it'll do to our, our number? Where do you think it'll take 2.9 down to? Um, maybe three, three per, um, well, not three percent, but point, yeah. point, point three. three. Okay, let's try it. Okay, so um, let's play back our, our, uh, Let's keep our eye on, on the upper left-hand graph and see how, how it's changed. So now we're seeing uh, renewable energy grow. We're seeing natural gas shrink, okay? So once again, we got a, 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 a two-tenths of a point bump out of it. Um, so that's pretty good. Was that, is that what we got? Let's see. So oh, we got a one-point bump. So it didn't do quite what you expected. And again, it's taking us a while to ramp up on, you know, we're still looking at 2040 here. Um, and um, let's see if we've got some other clues out here. Uh, I'm gonna change this graph to, to an area graph here. And let's see what's driving our carbon uh, our, our net greenhouse gas emissions here. So if we look to 2020 to 2040, which is an important time to try to make progress, we still see a lot of this charcoal gray area is CO2 from burning fossil fuels. That's still the biggest amount of, of problem uh, that's keeping us a little limited here. But also in blue, we've got a lot of methane there that we could try to tackle. So maybe that can give us a clue as to some of our suggestions here. So let's look at what we've done. So we've amped up renewables, put a tax on coal and oil. We've electrified transport. Um, any other, oh, uh, I'm sorry, you had another suggestion. Um, you said- uh, well, um, Increase energy efficiency. Uh, in, in what, transportation or building uh, in, in industry? In, um, can we do both? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so what do you think we're going to get out of energy efficiency? Just quickly, what, what do you think? Uh, well, I'm hoping at least 0. 0.3 or 4. Okay, let's try it. Okay, so we're, 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 we're going to be a lot more efficient we're going to look at trying to become 5% more efficient per year. And notice what's happened to our overall energy consumption here. Uh, we've, we've dropped from over 1,000 uh, exajoules a year to about uh, almost 1,100. Uh, and, and we see that uh, we're using less renewable energy, but we're using a lot less energy overall. But it only bought us a tenth of a degree um, efficiency. And, and let me tell you that these things aren't additive. The, 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 the longer you go on, the less effective a solution is going to be than if you did it, made it the first solution. Mm -hmm. So um, that's part of the systems dynamic model here that we're, we're using. But it did, um, it did reduce um, our overall greenhouse gases, but we still got a lot of coal, a lot of methane. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to look at if we do building uh, energy efficiency. Uh, let's see if we can get more of a jump out of that, because building an industry it's a bigger sector even than transport. So let's, so that took us down 
to 2.5. Okay. Okay, that's that that got us a couple of extra points. Let's play it back it's from 2.7 to 2.5. Look at our overall energy usage has dropped way down below 600 exajoules, almost below 500 exajoules. Where where we've gotten a 50 percent, more than 50 percent energy usage reduction. Um, still a lot of coal and oil and methane. We haven't even touched methane yet. Now remember, methane is released from industrial processes. It's released from agricultural processes and nitrous oxide from fertilizer. We've got, you know, uh, and methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, we, we haven't done anything with deforestation or afforestation. You know, nuclear is a carbon free um, energy source. Um, uh, any other suggestions now? We're, we're getting close. We're getting Why don't we in, increase nuclear, subsidize nuclear. Okay, here we go. We can put a big subsidy on nuclear. I want you to look at what happens uh, to that thin blue line. Um, we're going to take it to seven cents per kilowatt hour. Look at the, our, 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 our energy usage here of nuclear in the lower uh, uh, right-hand corner. And what did it get us? Let's play it back. Oh, it didn't do anything. Wait a minute, did it give us, it didn't even give us a 10th of a degree Fahrenheit. Um, why is that? Look, look at this, look at the green area and look at the blue area and, and what's happening. Blue is growing, but green is shrinking. The nuclear is cannibalizing our renewable energy. So it's kind of not doing anything positive for us. They're competing with one another. Um, uh, the other thing I want to point out, and, and thank you for that suggestion, is look when it's happening. Look when nuclear is coming on. It's not coming on till 2040. And that's because it takes five years to plan it. It takes a, a, another few years to, to get it permitted. It takes 10 years to build it. So we're, we're not bringing the power on till the late 2030s or 2040s. And um, okay, here's a spoiler alert. What we do between 2020 and 2040 to bring this line down to bring these emissions down is absolutely critical to our effectiveness at the end of the century. Why? Because we're building up that 40, 50, 60 gigatons a year of greenhouse gases year in and year out. That's an additional liability we're building every year that we don't get it under control in this time frame. So we got to take action that's quick and, and, and meaningful as soon as we can to try to impact the difference. So uh, any other clues? We're getting close. We didn't strike. Try, the, yeah, try the carbon pricing because that could be implemented quicker than building nuclear plants in that. Carbon pricing is quick. Okay, so what's the difference between taxing coal, oil, and natural gas and putting a carbon price. What we, what we mean by carbon price is that we're putting a price on the fossil fuel companies, coal, oil, and natural gas for the, um, for the uh, emissions from burning those fossil fuels. So these taxes are a tax on every ton of coal or oil or barrel of oil, but these are a, a price on the emissions. And the difference there is, is with a carbon price, if you did something like carbon capture and sequestration, there would be a refund for it that you wouldn't necessarily get with just taxing the volume of coal, oil, and natural gas. So let's, let's put a steep carbon price on there and see what that does. What do you think that's gonna do? Uh, who made that suggestion and, and what do you think is, uh, is, is it's going to do for us? 
And with me, Ken, I, it might get us a couple tenths at most, but I was curious to see because I hear it discussed in the political articles and that of, is something that could be done relatively quickly. Okay, let's let's put a very hefty carbon price on it. And look what that did. That got us, uh, let's play it back. That took us from 2.5 to 2.2. Hard to do at this stage of the game. Congratulations on that suggestion. Look what it's doing to our, our energy from fossil fuels in this 2020 to 2040 timeframe. Because it's quick to implement, it's really helping us out there. And um, look what it's doing over to the graph on the right. It's really bringing down um, natural gas some oil and even a little more coal uh, than our tax already has. And it's opening up uh, renewables a little bit sooner. So that made a difference. And, and we're getting close to 2.0. Give me another suggestion. Let's get it to 2.0 here and then figure out uh, and, and, and then uh, uh, call it a day. Any other suggestions? We got any vegetarians out there? Oh, me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Let's pretend for a moment. Everybody's going to do the Lancet diet. Okay. And the Lancet diet is a, uh, uh, that's very, very little meat, mostly legumes and nuts and stuff like that. And, um, and that would give us a 20%, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to kick that up a little bit because it would also buy us some energy efficiency um, and um, uh, it would, and, and also it will help us with deforestation because we're not, we're not uh, doing as much to the rainforest here uh, as we otherwise would be. So um, that's, uh, that's got us, to 2.1 uh, degrees uh, C. Uh, let's have another suggestion and see if that can take us down to our 2.0 level. Carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's go to coal here and um, uh, let's. Uh, Let's uh, go down to carbon capture and sequestration. We're going to incentivize it, and we're going to have, uh, and we're going to assume we can generate some breakthroughs for it. And um, uh, that uh, maybe if we accelerate coal retirement uh, a little bit, um, that takes us down to 2.0. Congratulations, um, uh, you did it. And <laughs> it, it took quite a few activities to do it, but, uh, but you did it. And, uh, and now we've, uh, we, 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 we've gotten, you know, we, we didn't save the coral reefs. We got to get well below 2.0 to save the coral reefs, but you've got a, uh, you've got a much better future than we had. And, uh, and, and, and it is doable. It is doable. Now, um, what, uh, let's, tell me uh, what surprised you uh, about this or what, uh, what are some of the, um, what are some of the uh, kind of standout things that uh, are uh, sticking in your mind after we've gone through this exercise? Anything surprise you? Any uh, interesting learnings come out of this? Well, I learned that um, it's will have more of an effect on um, climate change for the positive if we work on energy efficiency in buildings and industry it, rather than transport. Although it's probably good to work on both, but the buildings and industry is more powerful. Yeah. Building as far as energy efficiency. Building an industry is more powerful. Yeah. And uh, 
What about, uh, let me pull that back up for a second. And uh, any other insights there? That, that's a big sector that you had made that suggestion on. So that, yeah, you know, taking action in, in large sectors of, of pollution is, is really important too. In a way, it's kind of discouraging that even making dramatic changes in your model didn't help us out a whole lot. I mean, you got to make a lot of big changes in a lot of areas and that doesn't really seem realistic, which makes for a bleak looking future. Yeah, there, 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 there was no one silver bullet in there, was there? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a great insight. Um, uh, you gotta pick the right sectors. Um, uh, did, did, did everybody understand kind of my point around the, uh, how quickly you have to act to bring it down? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the difference that that carbon pricing made uh, was really important, uh, even though we made that later in our actions. I'd like to show you, um, I'd like to show you some shortcuts to get there faster. Um, if you uh, will stick with me on this. Um, so here's our scenario uh, once again, and uh, that, we, that we did, congratulations. I'm gonna open up a clean uh, slate here. Um, and um, we're gonna look at our net greenhouse gas emissions here. And uh, uh, we've got 3.6 degrees. And, and then I'm going to I'm going to open up one more box here and I'm going to I'm going to program in a piece of legislation that's currently sitting in Congress. Um, it's it's a carbon pricing piece of le legislation. There's four sitting in Congress right now that I'm aware of. They all put a price on carbon emissions. Uh, one of them is bipartisan. Uh, the other three have been introduced by Democrats. And this one that I'm going to model, uh, because I know how to model it the best, is called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And what it does is it puts a $15 per ton of carbon emissions fee on that. And let's say we're starting it and we start it this year in 2021. And uh, in that first year, just one year, we're going to put a small $15 per ton fee on all fossil fuels. That would be about the equivalent of 15 cents a gallon on a gallon of gas. But, uh, but every year after that, we're going to put a $10 or 10 cent a gallon fee on it. And we're going to do that for the rest of the century, up to 10 cents a gallon. So that's going to kick us up to another $770 per ton um, by, the, uh, by the end of the, uh, uh, oh, let's see, uh, carbon price. So that's 2020. Final carbon price is, yeah, $770 a ton. Uh, we're going to start to achieve that in 2022. And uh, it's going to take us um, really, uh, it's going to take us 78 years to reach that, that price. So if we do that coming out of the chute, what happens is we have now come down from 3.6 to 2.5, a full 1.1 degree with one action, a carbon price that starts out slow and just continues to go up a little bit every year. So that's current legislation sitting in there. That has gotten us more than halfway there with one move. Now, remember that we, 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 we talked about carbon pricing, excuse me, we talked about methane as being a really powerful player. So if we go down here to, um, uh, and, and we're able to, we're not going to get everybody to be vegetarians and, 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 but if we got, if we were able to reduce even um, 
you know, 60% of the waste emissions from agriculture and 60% from industrial emissions, uh, that's got us down another couple of points there. So methane emissions, uh, if we came out of the chute and did that, it probably would have been 0 0.4, 0 0.6 degrees C. But, but we're taking action very quickly early on here. And if furthermore, we uh, focus on this big sector of energy efficiency and electrification. Now there with uh, our two moves in methane, our move in, in carbon pricing and some, some focused efficiency here, we can get out there a lot faster. And then if we want, we can, we can you know, stop deforestation or do any one of a number of things to pick up the extra point there. So with really moving one, two, three, four, five levers, we've gotten there. So I, I hope, Ken, that that gives you a little more hope. There are, there, there, I think one of the takeaways I want you to have is that some levers are a lot more impactful than others. And I have to say that growing a trillion trees is not one of them. Why? Because you got to secure a land mass the size of India. You got to, that's going to take a lot of time. You got to plant a lot of trees. And you got to wait 40 years for them to grow. So th that doesn't help us in here between 2020 and 2040. So that's, um, that's uh, one of the points that, um, you know, one of the takeaways that I, I, I want to make sure that uh, everybody uh, has with that. Does that make sense to you? So carbon pricing, I want to tell you a little bit more about carbon pricing since there's some bills in Congress right now that, that put a price on carbon emissions. Uh, three of the four bills you know, have the, the Treasury Department collect that from the fossil fuel companies and give them back to every American household or, or most of the American households. And, and a couple of the bills in the bill I just modeled, it goes back to every household. And a couple of other bills, it goes back to the poor and the middle class, but not the richest Americans. Now, the other bill uh, was introduced by a Republican, and it is a uh, uh, it collects uh, has the Treasury Department collect those uh, those fees from the fossil fuel companies, but it goes to build roads. It doesn't go back to keep the consumer whole. So let me pop in and, and, uh, and just uh, go back to my slides for a second here and share screen and uh, um, tell you a little bit about this legislation. So um, th this category of legislation is called uh, carbon fee and, and dividend. Oops, I'm, I'm in the wrong. I'm in the wrong deck, doggone it, hang on a second. Um, let me uh, close this out and uh, get into another one here. Um, let me share again and uh, go into my PowerPoint. Let's see here. Now I gotta bring that up. Uh, All right. Okay. Sorry about that. Hang tight. Okay. So Okay, can you see this PowerPoint slide? Yeah. All right. So if we look at the, uh, if we look at this type of legislation like this Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act. So the oil, gas and coal companies 
pay a fee at the point of extraction. It starts at $15 a ton. It increases $10 a ton annually. The Treasury Department collects it and it goes to a, um, uh, it goes out to US households as a monthly dividend check. Now, the whole idea here is that fossil fuels are not priced to reflect their true cost. They're heavily subsidized. The playing field is not level for clean energy to compete. And what we need to do is make fossil fuels more reflect their true cost. We saw all the storm damage and, and natural disaster damage that is in part contributed by fossil fuel burning. And now we want to incentivize the market to invest in clean energy. At the same time, we want to keep consumers whole because fossil fuel companies are going to raise their price. So why a carbon fee and dividend? It, economists would tell you it keeps the money in the economy at the consumer level. So that makes it better for economic growth. It, uh, it uh, protects low income and middle class households, and it encourages conservation, especially of burning fossil fuels. And it's, it's more transparent. There, there was a, a unprecedented uh, survey of US economists of all political stripes that said uh, that over 3,500 of them said that a carbon tax offers the most cost effective lever to reduce carbon emissions at the scale and scope that's in speed that's necessary. And, and you saw how it worked on the uh, model. It, it, in one fell swoop, we got more than 50% of the way we needed to go. So, um, uh, another reason. So once again, uh, coal, oil, and natural gas companies are paying the fee. The Treasury Department collects it. So what does it mean to the uh, average U.S. household? Let's say we got two adults, two kids. Well, in year one, those monthly dividend checks would add up to $716. By year five, because it goes up a little bit every year, it would be more like $2,000. And by year 10, almost 3,000. That's gonna cover a lot of higher gas costs and higher electric bills if you got a coal-fired power plant on the other end. But most important, it's going to uh, drop uh, carbon emissions by 40% in the 30, uh, 2030 to 2032 timeframe. It has the potential to grow a lot of jobs without harming the economy. And by the way, there's some border adjustment legislation written into that bill and all of the bills that keep us uh, competitive internationally. And, and we are losing uh, guys uh, that have asthma or breathing difficulties, COPD. There's, we lose over 100,000 of them a year and you're gonna get cleaner air. And it, by the way, it's a revenue neutral program. It passes pay go restrictions. There's about 81 members who have signed on to this bill. Um, but uh, um, so uh, I, I, I want to just stay on this category because I know a lot of people haven't heard about this. And unfortunately, um, the Democratic administration and Republicans are not talking about this a lot. Ken, you've heard about it. I don't know if others on the call have heard about it, but it's so important because it's so fast to implement, you could implement it tomorrow and it would start having this huge effect because of the very strong signal that you're sending out to the marketplace. So, you know, I, we'll, we're gonna talk about uh, what, what we can do here, but I, I just wanna stop and answer any questions that people might have about this carbon fee and dividend uh, concept as a tool to try to address uh, climate change and global warming. We've seen that it, 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 it's a very high leverage tool as, as you model this in various climate models. Um, any questions about that that I can answer for you while we're on there? Louise? Um, I have a question about other countries. Are there any other countries that are interested or even thinking about doing something? Because if yeah. all if other countries were interested, that would certainly bring the numbers down. Yeah. When you look at, we're actually behind, we're kind of behind on that one as a country. 
So if you look at the developed countries, um, most of them have a carbon price, except for us in Australia. Um, the UK has one. The European Union has one. Canada put one into place last year. So and in Canada, this is quite, quite a bit higher than this because they already have a very high percentage of their power from hydro, which is green power. So they're, they, have to, they have to put extra uh, carbon tax dollars on it. But the United States is gonna have to start paying tariff, border tariff adjustments to these other countries that have them, just like we would if China was shipping into us and they didn't have a carbon tax, but we did, we would put a border adjustment on that. And that would be an incentive for them to have a carbon tax so that they didn't have to give us the money, they could keep it in their country. So there's some built-in kind of incentive to these types of legislation um, that, uh, that kind of uh, promote that, um, that, you know, that promote uh, and encourage other countries to do the same thing that we're doing. But so we haven't got there yet. And, and, you know, we're talking about clean energy standards. I didn't know if anybody had heard that yet. Uh, Biden is talking about that. And that, that if we had modeled that, and we could have, we have that on the simulator, that only gets us a couple of tenths of a point. Why? Because it's only in the electricity sector. And the electricity sector is only 25% of where our fossil fuel burning comes from. So it, it, it's not, uh, it, it helps, but it's again, like many of the other things that we tried, it doesn't help a lot. Uh, it's, is it worth doing? And a lot of these things are worth doing. It's worth growing a lot of trees because, uh, because of soil erosion and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it's a good thing to do psychologically. There's many reasons to grow trees, but, but, and there's many reasons to take many of these actions, but is it gonna get us where we wanna go from a, um, from a, a, a carbon pollution and a global warming standpoint? You know, that's, that's what the, the primary objective of tonight's meeting was. So I don't wanna discount any of the things that we talked about because there may be other reasons to do them and other benefits to do them uh, uh, unrelated to trying to get us down to a 2.0 uh, uh, centigrade uh, as quickly as possible. Any other questions or comments on there that I can uh, answer for you? I'm just wondering, National Geographic had an article about the climate change, global warming, whatever you want to call it, in the Arctic, where the permafrost was starting to release methane, yeah. which is something we don't want. And there really isn't an easy way to say, well, just throw a you know, piece of saran wrap over it. You can't do yeah. that. And have you seen anything in the literature that you're looking at? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, a huge risk that's looming out there because uh, uh, it can has the potential to re release so much methane, and that could really that could really blow up what we're trying to do now. This model has some methane emissions from permafrost thaw in there, but it doesn't have that kind of tipping point uh, methane release in there, catastrophic methane release where that to, to happen. Uh, although we could, you know, the great thing about this model is if you um, if you don't like the assumptions, you can change the assumptions uh, in this. Model. You can reach down inside the model, and uh, there's there's ways to do that. So it's uh, really a, uh, a a flexible tool to use to try to address situations like that. And we could we could if we had more time go into the model and try to um, uh, address it. But the, uh, uh, you know, one thing I did promise to do was uh, I promised to put a link to this model in the chat box. And uh, I've done that. Uh, I also, um, you know, uh, we go out and, and we talk, you know, I've, I've, I've talked to probably representatives, U.S. representatives of the state of Illinois uh, about trying to you know, take action on climate change. 
probably eight times. And we talk about uh, carbon fee and dividend or carbon taxes in those discussions. And what I hear from them is, uh, many of them, we, we do have four representatives that have co-sponsored that legislation that I showed you in, in Illinois. But what I hear from a lot of them is, well, I'm not hearing from my constituents that this is important to them. So I can't tell you how important it is for us as constituents to our representatives, to our, our, our US senators to call and write them at least once a month and tell them that we want action on, on, uh, on climate uh, and that we, uh, or if you have become kind of a believer as I am in carbon fee and dividend, that, you know, hey, we, we want you to co-sponsor the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act, or we want you to get behind carbon fee and dividend legislation. I put some numbers in the link where you can write your congressman or call them. Uh, there's one service you can call them and they'll, if you want, they'll send you a text or a, an email once a month. They'll tell you who to call and what to say uh, about carbon fee and dividend, you know? And uh, so there's uh, actions that you can take there, but regardless of whether you use this or some other means to contact them, please contact them once a month. You can also, uh, jo you can also uh, join uh, groups like uh, Citizens Climate Lobby uh, or you know, Sierra Club that are promoting legislative actions, but um, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby is one group that they, they're nonpartisan and they just focus on trying to get kind of like carbon fee uh, legislation uh, in, in place. Um, there is, um, there's also um, talking about it with neighbors, um, with uh, people at work, or with, uh, you know, trying to share, hey, this is a problem, we need to address it, you know, um, you know, what do you think some of the solutions are? Maybe, you know, play with this climate model and see what you think some of the most uh, uh, beneficial solutions are, but Remember that keeping coal, oil, and natural gas in the ground as soon as possible is critical to that end of century temperature. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. <laughs> and uh, I, I appreciate everybody spending time here tonight. Is there any other questions or, or comments or uh you know, we all have a role to play with this. And from my perspective, we need about 50 times more activity than is happening right now, especially on carbon fee and dividend. It's, 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 it, it could be popular, it could be fast. As people are getting these dividend checks, it's gonna be, it would be like, you know, getting a, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna like that. Um, so, uh, and then that sets everything else in motion. But let me see if there's any other comments before we, we wrap up and, uh, and let you go. I, I'm very much interested in hearing uh, if, if we just take a moment of silence about the world that you created here, this two degree centigrade world, what do you think what do you like about the world that you created with the modeling that you did tonight? Any thoughts on that? What does it mean to your grandkids? What does it mean to, uh, does it give you more peace of mind knowing that we can get there? Any, any thoughts or feelings on that? Because some people get quite emotional about this subject and it, sometimes it's good just to let your, your thoughts out on it. I liked your presentation, Andy. I still come away, I guess, a little discouraged that can we really get our fellow citizens, our legislators and that to take the action? Because like it or not, it sounds like a doomsday scenario if we don't take action. And yet everybody seems to say, well, you know, like you, like you said, a lot of people are telling the congressman they're worried about their potholes, but they're not worried about 
what's going to happen when we get to 2100 that you know, it's not going to be a very nice world the way we're going right now yeah you know i'll tell you uh it, it's ken it's it's a uh, um for me the i get i get pretty highly anxious about this subject because i've been watching it for a long time and i've I've seen it unfold, and I especially have seen it unfold underwater. And um, so ang action is the great anecdote for anxiety. And that's why I'm calling them every month. I'm writing them. If there's a town hall, I'm asking them. I'm there, and I'm asking them what they're doing about it. Um, uh, I, I try to join people that are pulling together and lobbying them uh, and, and have tried to bone up on my lobbying skills. And uh, so, you know, I, there, there's something that I'm doing every day to try to bring attention to it, whether it's writing a letter to the editor or, um, or uh, trying to uh, reach out to some company to endorse a piece of legislation like the one I showed you tonight, or trying to uh, work with uh, with other folks that um, you know and and band together with uh, with some other people to uh, learn more about it and uh, and and figure out the smartest courses of action and how to make the most impact. And that that's where you know. Uh, you know, we our sister organization, Citizens Climate Lobby, they do that all day and every day. I run around to different, um, I run around to libraries in uh, uh, faith-based organizations and stuff like that, just trying to get the word out that there are solutions to this. Because the 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 part that's that's really concerning is the people that are going, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, it's going to be bad. There's nothing we can do about it. Oh, there is something that we can do about it. And now you've got a tool to show them. <laughs> you can pull up that on your on your computer and say, there is something that we can do about it. <laughs> Here's what we got to do. If the whole world did this, we got to do it. Is it going to be easy? No. Is it going to be worth it? Yes. So we all got to get busy on this. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's great people like you that are interested enough to come out and find out more about it and start to use your your critical thinking to uh, you know try to make something happen, and there, we can't expend enough effort towards this. And it's very important. It's it's getting some attention finally. There's still time, but there's not time to waste. So we got to we got to get on it and stay on it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, Jennifer. Thank thanks for getting on tonight, PD. Um, we lost Alan and, and, uh, and Deb, but that's great. And um, Louise and Ken, thank you so much. And uh, we appreciate you being on. Oh, by the way, my, uh, a, my email address I put in there, if, if you think of any questions that you had wished that you would ask. Uh, uh, and Janet, I'm hoping that um, we can... Um, we can, uh, I'll send you an email. So if you, you have the email addresses to the people that were on tonight, you can also send them this chat if they didn't copy it and paste it, but they wish they had later, you can send them an email and they'll have this information on there as well. Okay. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, good luck out there. Don't stop talking about it. Get in front of your uh, representatives and, uh, and your congressional representatives and uh, keep fighting the fight. It's a battle worth fighting for. And I thank you everybody and Janet, thank you again for hosting this and uh, appreciate all your efforts on this in the Aurora Public Library. Thanks so much for a, a great evening. Well, thank you. Thank you. We'll see everybody. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Janet. We appreciate thank it. You. You're welcome. Sure people know. You're welcome. Okay, good night. Bye. Good night.